Okay, if this is your first Sunday here, you came on a very special day. One is, uh, this is going to be the shortest sermon you've ever heard me preach. I don't have much voice left. My voice has been giving me problems all week, and it's about faded to nothing. By the end of this message, it will be nothing. You've also come on a special day because it is our Heritage Sunday day, a day where we pause and we remember the over 175 years that our church has been here. We think about our ministry. We think about why God has placed us here as a church in Metropolis in Massac County. Today we fellowship together after services to go over and eat together and, and enjoy our time together. Today that we come around with a very hurting heart for family in our church, families in our church who have lost loved ones this week. Most of you know about the tragic death of Justin Palmer, passed away last night. I want to pause here and say something as a pastor to you before I get into this message too deep. And you'll hear this again in the message. You folks did an incredible job for that family over the last few days. I, I'm not even going to try to list out the number of, of folks that came up to the hospital and were over to the hospital in Cape Girardeau to help out, to minister to the family, folks that were there Thursday night at the emergency room. Over the coming days, I thank you in advance for the things that you're gonna do to help that family through probably one of the most difficult periods of grief that I've ever witnessed. That's what church is. Somebody asked me yesterday, of course, we also have other families that have lost loved ones. Sue Miller lost a son. Jack Clayfer lost a sister this week. Of course, Jack's facing test results and issues with his health. And I think Jack gave me one of the greatest demonstrations of what I'm gonna preach about this morning. A few moments ago, he was out in the vestibule talking. And he was talking about the gospel and the hope that is founded there. This week, sitting in the hospital and trying to help a family in terrible times of grief, I know Cliff heard this a lot. Two questions kept coming up over and over and over again. Why? I don't have an answer for the why. I have a large picture answer for why. Why do bad things happen? Why do bad things happen? One of the teenagers asked the other day, why are our parents dying? I don't know the answer to that question. I, the immediate answer to that question. In the specific case, I know the big case. We live in a broken world. A world where even good people suffer. And somebody asked me this question, how? How do we go through this? How do we get through a time of grief? And everybody here is going to, at one point in your life, have a time of grief. You're going to lose someone. This week, I know Cliff was going through it. I know all the people that were up there trying to help this family. As we were walking through a season of grief with them, we were really reliving moments of grief in our own life. Everyone is going to, at one moment or the other, suffer a loss. And the question then is, how do you get through it? And to be honest with you, so many times what we do is we rest and we trust in the wrong things in those moments. We go back, we give people little, little trite sayings or, or, or little hallmark you know, wishes. God has given us the most important thing. How do we get through life? How do we get through suffering? By relying on and clinging to and grasping a hold of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today, I don't think it's any accident that we come on this morning to celebrate the Lord's Supper. 
Listen to this passage. And I, by the way, I know it's hard to listen to me with this voice and I apologize. But listen to what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant. I wanna stop and just think about those two phrases for just a couple of minutes. This is my body. There's a theological statement there and you say, oh, pastor, why do you wanna talk about theology on a morning like this? Because what we believe is the thing that we rest upon. Listen to me, theology is not just some abstract thing. It is what we believe about God. It is the bedrock upon which we build our faith. And when Jesus says, this is my body, he is saying something massive right there. There are two incredible ideas when we think about Jesus. And you can find them both in John chapter one. And I had a whole plan to walk you through that chapter, but, but let me just summarize it really quickly. Jesus says two things in John chapter one about himself. Number one, he says that he is God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is absolutely divine. All of the nature of God exists in Christ. He is the creator. He is the sustainer of everything in our universe. He is God. But there's a second thing the Bible says in that chapter. And the word put on flesh. This is where our theology becomes flesh and blood. God put on human flesh and he came to live amongst us so that he can uh, understand what we go through. And we know that. The Bible tells us that Jesus understands all of our temptations. This is in Hebrews chapter four. He says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as you are, yet without sin. That means every temptation, every struggle that you have, Jesus understands it. I don't know about you, that's good news for me. Have you ever been in those moments where you're tempted to sin and you feel like you're the only one that's ever had that temptation? I got news for you. Jesus put on flesh and blood and he knows. He knows. Jesus knows the trials of daily life. He got tired. I'd like to think he had laryngitis. He got hungry. He had to deal with difficult people. I've spent a lot of hours with Cliff Easter this week. Many of them riding in a car together. Have you ever ridden with Cliff in a car. I'll describe it to you. Imagine having a chipmunk loose, but the chipmunk is deranged. And you think there's a nut somewhere hidden in it. No, it's been an honor, Cliff. He knows, he knows. When you have a difficult person in your life, God knows what that's like. Jesus knows what, he had difficult disciples. He understands our tragedies. That's an incredible idea. Somewhere along the line in Jesus' life as a young man, he lost his father. The Bible doesn't tell us what happened to Joseph. Did you know that? We don't know what happened to him. Probably the leading theory is, is that somewhere along the line he died. Some have suggested maybe he abandoned the family. 
We don't know. I think the Bible leaves that blank for us for a reason. Some of you are here today and you've experienced that kind of loss. Jesus knows. He understands. As soon as he was born, he had enemies that tried to kill him. He had to literally run for his life as an infant. Live as a refugee for a period of time in Egypt. His cousin, the forerunner of his ministry, John the Baptist, was brutally beheaded. He faced rejection. Have you ever been rejected, misunderstood? Jesus knows, he's been there. Probably one of the most incredible moments in Jesus' life is he was standing outside the tomb of his best friend, Lazarus. And in the shortest verse of the Bible, the Bible tells us Jesus did the most human of all things, he wept. He felt the loss. He understands what it's like. I never forget one time I was at a funeral. And I heard a Christian say this, don't cry because we know where they're at. Jesus cried and he knew he was gonna raise Lazarus from the grave. This is a world of brokenness. God has entered in to our brokenness and he has experienced it all and he understands. He's come into our experience not only to understand it, but to walk beside it. Have you ever been in that moment in your life when you're going through the hardest, most difficult trials of your life and God is right there helping you, guiding you, leading you. I know Cliff and I have talked about this several times just over the last couple of days. People say, how do you guys do it? How do you go minister to a family? You didn't learn to do that. They don't teach you that in seminary. That's when you just lean on God and trust that he's gonna walk you through it. And he's gonna give you what you need. He walks through life with us. When we sing that song and he walks with me and he talks with me, that's not just some fairy tale for Christians. That is truth. That is what we rely on. But listen, brothers and sisters, Not only did he come into the world to understand and walk through us with trials, he's come to overcome them. Because there's a second phrase in that verse. This is my body, but what's the second one? Say it for me so I can save my voice. This is my, oh, you know it. Y'all got laryngitis. This is my body. This is my blood. The greatest news is that we are redeemed through the shedding of Christ's blood on the cross. And in the moments of our greatest trials, that's the hope that we have. Every time I sit with a family that's lost a loved one, whether it was an expected loss, because there are expected losses, are there not? We sit with someone who's elderly and they've lived a full life and they're coming to the end. Or whether it's someone who dies tragically, the prime of their life. We stop and ask, How do we get through this? We rely on the gospel. 
Why do bad things happen? We live in a bad, broken world. We live in a world where sin has tinged every aspect of our existence. Every aspect. There's not a single thing in this universe that sin has not touched, that it has not ruined. Romans chapter eight says that the creation itself is groaning, waiting for the day of redemption. Everything has been ruined by sin. And yet God, through his son Jesus, entered into the world, took the sin of the world, took my sin, took your sin, and he nailed it to the cross so that we can have hope. See, when we stand here, we're not just remembering something that happened 2,000 years ago. Brothers and sisters, we're, we're celebrating the thing that gives us hope every single day of our lives. Some of you are sitting here this morning and there is a God-sized hole in the middle of your life. You are created in the image of God. Nothing has ever brought you peace or satisfaction. I want you to know that that hole, only God can fill it. You can put all the drugs you want to in your arm. You can drink as much alcohol as you want. You can have as much sex as you want. Make as much money as you want. It'll never fill, it'll never fill the hole in your life. Only Jesus can do. If you're here today and you never come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, know him today. Know him today. Repent of your sin. Put your trust in him. He's the only hope we have. Amen. Now I've about preached my voice right out. In a moment, Adrian's gonna come. Hey, I wanna say something to you again. I wanna stop and pause here. Thank you for you. First, thanks to staff. There you guys aren't staff. That's a bad name to call you. It sounds like you're the help. My co-ministers, thank you. Cliff. That's all I can say about that. No. You never want to have to minister in the situations we've been in this week. But if there's anybody I ever want to do it with, that's Cliff. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you guys for taking over and helping back home. Thank you guys who were there. Keep doing it. We have a whole broken community, not just from the one loss. We're all thinking about Lisa and her family today, but there's others. Hey, let's make a decision as a church. I told you a moment ago that when Jesus put on human flesh, that's where our theology becomes flesh and blood. But listen to me, you, you are his hands and his feet. When you come to the hospital on a night when a family has suffered the worst loss they could ever imagine, you are Jesus' hands. You are his feet. When you deliver them food, you are his hands. You are his feet. That's where our theology puts on flesh and blood. Jesus ministers through you. Amen. That's about all I can say today, literally and figuratively.